a very warm welcome to Carlton House, the British Academy, and this great Young Lives event. My name is Sam Gibson, and you'll see a little bit of me today throughout the margins, just trying to keep the um, sessions moving at a reasonable pace. We've got a great program today. Um, I have a social development background a long time ago. I worked for DFID, and I've worked with a few of you in the room before on issues around adolescence, girls, and development. It's really nice to see some familiar faces, and I'm sure many of you are happy to see each other as well. We've got some relatively generous breaks in the morning and in the afternoon. We've got a World Cafe session uh, in the afternoon as well, and a nice lunch break so you can catch up, um, hopefully, with lots of these old friends in those spaces. Um, we've got a really nice program today, a set of three panels. Um, we've also got some great keynote speakers, and as I mentioned, some smaller group formats where you've chosen, I think, and on your name tab you'll see which of the World Cafe sessions you want to be a part of later today. Um, I do need to cover a few bits of housekeeping before I hand over to the Young Lives Director to open, so if you can just tune in. Um, quickly, you might have noticed there are toilets in the bottom of the um, building, the stairs that you came up, you'll find toilets there. If you hear a fire alarm, we'd like you to take that seriously because we've not got one planned in the program and get out of the building as quickly and calmly as you can through the main entrance, the stairways that you came up, or if you travel further down this level, you'll see another fire exit that can take you down, which is an alternative to those main stairs if they're blocked. Um, we have got a media um, sort of presence around the hashtag YL Poverty Lessons. If you wanted to tweet to that hashtag, you're welcome to. Again, hashtag YL Poverty Lessons, and that's indicated in some of your little welcome notes that you've got there. If you need access to the wireless, um, the passcode is hospitality, lowercase. Uh, and lastly, before again handing over to Joe, the director, I'd like to let you know um, who in the room are the Young Lives staff that you might get in touch with if you have any questions about the program or if you want to know more about a particular piece of research. Please stand up and wave if you are a Young Lives staff member. Loads and loads. <laughs> lovely participants list which will help you put names and positions to the faces in the room because I imagine that there are a number of people you'd like to follow up with today, interesting speakers, people you met over coffee. You'll find their names and contacts in your participant pack. So hopefully today is in some ways the continuation of conversations many of you have had in the past but also um, the beginning of new conversations. So a very warm welcome. And I'd like to hand over to um, Jo Boyden, who many of you know as the Young Lives um, Director. She's been with Young Lives since 2005, almost the beginning. She's a professor of international development at Oxford University, and she's got a great mix of field research credibility. Um, she's managing the whole team and trying to make sense of all the work that Young Lives has been doing for 15 years across four countries. So without further ado, over to Jo. Thank you very much. Making sense of it, yes. Well, that, that certainly is meant to be my task. It's not always, it's a very complex project, as many of you will appreciate from today's discussions. I just want to welcome everybody here um, to this conference. Um, it's Young Lives, Child Poverty and Lessons for the SDGs is the focus. And our intention very much is to just give you some snapshots of the key findings from the study, but it's also very much to bring those of you who have practitioner, policy, and research experience, that you can bring that to bear in debating what we think the really big challenges are in the realization of the SDGs in relation to children, and also what should the priorities be, and what strategies and approaches do we want to be working with um, in, in the future. But before we start the day, I would just like to um, say that for us, this is a celebration as well. We're celebrating the fact that uh, the Department for International Development, uh, the British government, commissioned this study in 2001, and it's a 15-year research program, and we've had core funding from DFID throughout this period. Since DFID began uh, funding us, we've also received support from many other donor organizations, and I just want to really 
lay down the fact that for us, none of, none of this would have been possible without that act of faith to, that, that took place at the beginning of the millennium. The idea behind the study was very much to monitor progress of the MDGs. And of course, we're now at this interesting point of transitioning towards the SDGs. Um, just to give you a sense of the legacy of the study, um, it is in four countries, uh, Ethiopia, India, Vietnam and Peru, each, each one from one of the major developing regions of the world. The data from five survey rounds are archived publicly. Um, the fifth survey round hopefully will be archived very, very soon indeed. And that means permanent access for um, scholars, practitioners and policy makers throughout the world. And that for us is a very important legacy from the study. We have over 800 publications. Um, and of course, you'll appreciate that what we're able to share in one day is just a tiny fraction of that. We hope that we'll be pulling out the major findings from that. We also have the presence through five websites and a lot of social media activity. Um, that outreach is really fundamental to the study. It was set up all along with the intention of informing policy and practice. That was always the idea behind it. So policy engagement and impact is the other legacy and the other area of activity that we really focus on. That's in both the study countries, also globally, and, and as much as possible regionally as well. Um, so we, we operate at those multiple levels. We have great country teams. This study would never have been able to retain the children who we followed for these 15 years without the extraordinary um, role of the country teams, our, in, our institutional partners. Our four country directors are here today and you'll be very welcome to talk to them in the breaks and they will also be presenting some of the findings from their countries. And finally, I just want to mention the role of capacity building in all of this. We're very proud that um, with support from UNICEF, we've created two um, long-term centers in India and Ethiopia focused on childhood research and policy and practice. And we've also supported the development of a lot of other longitudinal studies in low and middle income countries. We give a lot of advice um, in terms of methodology and methods and so on. And I think before um, we begin the real program, I would like to acknowledge the contributions of so many people, but starting with the Young Lives children and their families and the communities and the policy makers that we engage with in the countries who've held patiently with us all this time. We have incredibly low attrition rates and that's also a reflection of the, the strength of relationships that the country teams have built. And it's not straightforward doing long-term research with people when you're not returning anything in the forms of programs or interventions and so on. So it's no simple um, achievement that. I want to thank Anna Botran. I don't, I don't know if Anna's actually in the room. Anna, who's standing there, who's led the uh, development of this, of this program today. Um, and she's, she's been amazing in terms of getting everything together for us. Um, I want to thank the country teams and their contributions and role, and the donors and those partners who've worked with us throughout. Right. Okay, it's, it's great to see a room full of, full of people interested here in Young Lives. Can I just ask, is there anyone here involved in research who is below 30? Uh, don't worry, you can put your hand up if you feel like it. Good, good, excellent. At least there's one. So um, I'm not going to call you out, but I'm going to call you Johnny from now on, okay? So I just want to imagine um, in 50 years from now, okay? And in 50 years, um, of course, the world will have changed dramatically. Um, uh, I probably one place won't have changed, which is Oxford. And we can imagine an academic there, Johnny, sitting there in a stuffy room somewhere, um, but actually writing the social economic history of the beginning of this millennium. Now, one of the amazing things that Johnny can do then is to actually go to the Young Life Study. And we'll be able to document, to describe and understand what's been happening in four important countries that went through a huge amount of change in this period, very carefully and very um, precisely. Well, one of the reasons why they can do this is because you know, the Young Lives data set is probably amongst the best documented and most carefully archived data sets that were collected in this period. 
I mean, it's quite amazing. It's cost a lot of money, a lot of resources. Never really anyone values that, but it was amazing. It is definitely one of these uh, resources that you can use, not just because one has great quantitative data, but also because there is a huge amount of contextual and qualitative data. That means that someone who goes and digs into archives doesn't have to do as sometimes I happen to have to do. I remember when writing my PhD and having to go to the 1960s and had just my quantitative data, but I couldn't tell the stories. And I had stories, but I couldn't back it up, what it actually meant in the battles and the trends. So that's quite an amazing thing. Now, this Johnny, when writing the socioeconomic history, so I'm totally convinced, will use this to, to, to actually write this. And um, what Johnny will be able to write about is to actually reflect on a period of very rapid change in four countries. You know, we didn't know when the study started that these countries would grow quite fast, that they would be expanding social policies, that they would do this in all kinds of messy ways, and that actually you could start documenting you know, all these kinds of changes and how it worked through in the distribution, how it meant, what it meant for individuals, for children, their families, and so on. So we can tell the story of the first part of this century um, in terms of health, in nutrition, in poverty, in socioeconomic skills, and as Louise already alluded to, the dreams that these people have and had. And we can start seeing, you know, what is it that we had there? And then most importantly, because, you know, as studies like this do, they don't have one little narrow hypothesis, one little narrow thing they're going to test. We can do this and can actually look at all the interdependencies in all kinds of areas that we could never write in our pre-analysis plans beforehand. We had no clue what would come out of this. And there's a real value to, to some work like this. Now, in particular, the story that can be told is that a study confirms that these first thousand days of early childhood are crucially important. But also, the story uh, can be told that life doesn't end at a thousand days. And that actually, um, there is something happening, especially when there are lots of changes in society in positive sense and in social services and, and opportunities for families, some catch-up is possible. Not for everybody, but things can happen. Even this can have a nice footnote there in saying, this was highly controversial with certain people lobbying only for investment in the first thousand days, but it is actually clearly something that is in the data. And so we can work on it and informed thinking that is not as narrow as simply saying life ends at thousand days. And so we can document that, that this is, comes through it. And now we can see what it all meant for these children during uh, adolescence and, and, and their teenage years in terms of how they were changing, how they were responding to change in society, what they thought, what they, what they felt, what they aspire to. And then it's great, we can see them through into adulthood. Of course, here's the rub. It's ending now. And basically, we won't see them into adulthood because that's not what uh, clearly is going to happen now. Now, I want to be careful here. You know, it was, an, and as already Louise said earlier, it was enormous foresight at the latter years of the last century that Diffit said, let's do something and let's actually document something that's happening. Yes, they said for the MDGs and the progress there, but let's document it. And let's document over a long enough period because just doing it for one year, a little study here and there doesn't tell us much. And let's document to do it. So the 50 year investment is being crucial and hugely exceptional. Um, and for me, it's been an enormous privilege to be part of you know, uh, doing this. You know, I do remember, and I was reminded seeing the nice weather, that the first site I talked about Young Lives was when Joe was considering bidding for taking over the project. That's another history. Um, but basically sitting in a sunny, on a, on a table in, in, in Queen Elizabeth House, uh, now the Department of International, of, of International Development at Oxford, and discussing whether I should get involved or not. And I do still remember the conversation because I did know my God, if I do this, this is going to take a lot of time, a lot of commitment, and uh, of course, even far more for Joe, who, who has stuck it out, rather than me with short attention span. But I'm still happy that I did do it, and we see it. But it is a really important question, asking ourselves, you know, what's next? 
these countries are still going through enormous change. We know from all the literature that what happened in childhood will determine how they will fare. But we have no way now of documenting it. There's no more data collection plans around the further rounds. They are not funded. Just when we potentially can see and actually give meaning to the content what demographic dividend may mean, because let's not forget this, this was in virtually all these countries, probably the largest birth cohorts ever in their history. And actually, we could see them through adulthood and what it actually would mean to get demographic dividend and how it works in the distribution, across the distribution, whether who can actually take advantage. So, this is, this is something that I clearly also want to appeal to. And I know there's people here with connections and have friends and families and maybe have checkbooks themselves to actually say, you know, this long-term vision, it can't be over. You know, it's really important that we have resources that not start from just scratch and say, oh, let's do it again and better. Of course we could do better. But actually say, let's see it through, because this is more than the good enough that I learned in DFID that's typically a, for a decision for spending 10 million was. If it's good enough, we can do it. This is more than good enough. This is exceptional already as a resource. And it's really crucial to, to, fund, to, to go further with this. You know, I know funding horizons have shrunk. Even in DFID, this was one of the largest, if not the largest, investment ever in a research project in social science. Don't let me start it on some of the science researchers. But anyway, uh, but in social science, this is, this is massive. But now, horizons shrink in virtually anywhere in, in donor organizations and in funders. Where research feels much more transactional, it needs to have impact. But not the impact, oh no, we can't value impact in 10 years, which is what you do with a cohort study. No, 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 impact probably yesterday and if possible today. Um, I mean, even though, and I can't help it, because it always uh, stuck with me that even at the time that Oxford ended up bidding for the project, there was a line in there that saying, from day one, you have to spend 10% on communications and 10% on policy. For God's sake, we haven't got any data yet. We have nothing to say. But that's the typical thing, that a fifth of your budget. In fact, if I think about it, if some of this, I, I know Paul, I won't take your job there, but, uh, but if we had some of that money from the early years uh, that was spent on the policy when we had nothing to say really and we had to scramble to something to say from the court study, we could probably do the further rounds now, but that's another matter. Um, <laughs> but it is the kind of thing, it's actually looking forward. And so this is where I want to end. So it is actually, you know, it's amazing to be able to celebrate where we are now. But this cannot be the end. There has to be a vision of where we're going to take this forward. And I think it has to be something where we have studies that bear witness of change. And that document change when it's happening. And that is important in people in the research communities, in universities and in funding bodies to do this, you know. I would like Johnny to be able to write properly the history of this generation. History doesn't end at 15. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Louise and Stefan, for um, encouraging us not only to look back and celebrate what we've achieved so far, but uh, making sure that we think ahead as well. Uh, many thanks. We're entering now the part of our program, um, we're going to have three panels throughout the day, one on child development, one on child protection, and one on child poverty. The next um, panel is on child protection, which is great. Um, and I just want to lay out a little bit what to expect from each of these panels. We're asking them in some ways to do the impossible, but there's so much richness, you can imagine, after 15 years, um, it's difficult to sort of pick exactly what we're going to highlight. So what we've got is three speakers for each of the panels, and each of those speakers has been asked to um, present some top-line findings or insights um, in a mere 10 minutes. And I'm afraid, in order to make sure that um, we have time to hear from all the listed speakers. We're going to have to be pretty tight on time. Our colleague Paul here has some um, serious bits of technology here, which say five minutes, three minutes, one minute, stop. And um, if you could please, um, he's lovely looking, but I know he has sharp teeth and a sharp bite. So um, if you could please um, try to keep an eye on Paul if he's trying to keep your attention. That'll make sure that we, we can hear from everyone throughout the day.
Um, at the end of each of the three presentations, we'll have a quick comment from the chair, and then the chair will take um, short rounds of questions. We'll have about 20 minutes of um, sort of Q&A and discussions. Um, as you might expect, if the questions and comments are able to be relatively succinct, then we'll get to hear from more of you in the room, and we're keen to do that. So I'd like to introduce, um, please, Martin Woodhead, who is um, going to chair the next panel on child development. He's got a keen um, interest and long experience in early childhood development education and in children's rights. He's an associate research director at Young Lives and an emeritus professor at the Open University. He's also a trustee for UNICEF UK and he's been advisor to the UN Commission on the Rights of the Child. So if I can ask um, Martin and his panel to come on up and take it away. You're welcome. So two of the panel are here. Oh, here's Rena. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Great to see everybody, and it's wonderful to be, as Stefan was saying, and Joe, and the Vice Chancellor, this very historic moment in the life of the project that I've been involved with right from the beginning. A project that, uh, as often happens with these things, wasn't really planned for my involvement. Joe phoned me up one day and said, Martin, are you doing anything? <laughs> Little did I know my life would be determined from that. And what excited me about the project then, and it excited me ever since, is that it's not an ordinary project. This is a boundary-breaking project in so many ways, ways I'm sure you know. It breaks boundaries by virtue of being such a long-term-based long -based longitudinal study. It's a cross-country study with all the opportunities for looking at those comparisons. It's a two-cohort study. So, what we, and we didn't really realize the significance of the two cohort study at the time, is enabled us to see not just what's happening for these children as they're growing up, but what's happening for two generations of children, those changes that are happening. It's a multidisciplinary study. We've got anthropologists talking to economists. Quite extraordinary. We even brought Stefan Durkin into the program and managed to get to talk to him. Sensibly. <laughs> and it's a research and policy study, not just a pure research project with multidisciplinary and so on. That's enough. So we're only going to be doing tasters on different aspects of the project. Today, this panel will begin to get us started with a, just a, a very tightly fitting title called Food for Life and Education for All, I'm sure we can do that in an hour. Three panel members, Rob Hughes would speak first, followed by Andy, and then Reno. Very pleased, first of all, to welcome Rob. Rob is from SIF, and I think it's actually rather nice that we're not starting with a Young Lives person, we're starting with someone representing one of the funding agencies that has provided significant support for us, additional to our core funding, SIF. Um, as many of you will realise, we thought it was going to be Sarah Crowley, sorry, Siobhan Crowley, uh, in Rob's position, Siobhan as Executive Director of SIF, very sadly had a little accident on a bicycle uh, last week and is in hospital. Thankfully, she's okay. Uh, but clearly she's in no state to be doing presentations. So Rob is here, and Rob is great to have here because Rob has a background in health. Uh, he's worked for DFID, and he's now with SIF, and it'd be in very interesting to hear, as a start in this present meeting today, his perspective on some of the issues we've been working with. I won't say any more too much because Andy will explain that he's going to mainly think about the design of the study and the way we've been able to try to do some quite creative modelling of the longitudinal process in the way we've worked on the data. And then Renu will remind us that this is a cross-country study by talking particularly about India, because Renu is country director for India, uh, especially inequity issues, equity issues uh, around poverty, but also especially around gender. Now, we're short of time, and of course I've already used a bit of time, and I'm going to then move straight to Rob, 
and invite him to speak. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes, but probably we'll have to do the panel uh, statements one after the other and then discussion at the end. But I, I, I allow myself the privilege of seeing how it goes. Rob. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, and thank you very much to um, the Young Lives team for inviting SIF to be here. And as, as, as Martin said, firstly, let me apologise on behalf of Siobhan that she can't be here, but she has a very good excuse. Um, so, secondly, I wanted to just congratulate the team for what's such an incredibly rich and um, powerful uh, set of, set of um, endeavours, really. Um, you know, I think it's 800 publications and counting. Um, and, you know, and I speak very much as someone who's sitting in the kind of consumer of that rather than the, the developer of it. Um, it's incredibly useful to have this. It's, we are, it's hard to measure, and perhaps Stefan hinted at some of the challenges of that, and, but the importance of it. It's hard to measure the impact of these things, but it's, it's fair to say they change our thinking, and that's what I'm going to try and talk about. Um, you know, and I think what, what, I'll, what I won't do is I won't talk about detailed insights from the studies, because I'm the worst person in the room probably to do that, um, and there'll be others who will cover that much better. But what I will talk about is how, we're, how it's challenging our thinking, and how this, this research and other is challenging our thinking. Um, and I think the other point I wanted to make is that we kind of owe that to the participants, those people who have taken their, their time, and it was great that Joe made that point as well, um, to really invest quite a lot of their own, their own lives to allow us to help learn about them and other people who are similar. Um, so I'll just make three points. I'm going to just try and ex explain how at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation we are trying to think through how, you know, as a result of the success of reducing child mortality, we are really trying to think intelligently about not just survival but also children thriving and reaching their potential. And Martin said he was up for being a bit, a bit propositional and trying to get some conversation, so I will, so take it with that point. I'm gonna, but I'm going to make three points. I'm going to start by saying I think we need to think about helping children to be smarter and their brains developing and not just taller. And that's a big, a big insight for me, and it comes back to the point made earlier about proxies of stunting. I want to talk a little bit about care and why care matters and how we maybe don't think about it enough. Um, and then a third point, something that we're grappling with at SIF, is that young lives are increasingly urban lives. Um, they're not, there's still a large rural issue too, but there's something with it we're thinking with. So I'll talk about those and hopefully we have some discussion about those. So first, smarter, not just taller. Um, food and nutrition absolutely matter. But there's a trap, and I'll talk about three traps we've fallen into. I think we've fallen into a bit of a trap of really focusing on linear growth as the outcome. Um, we really, and the, the rationale for that has been around brain development and IQ and human capital. So we, we, our ultimate outcome, we're all on the same page about. We want, we want people to reach their potential. We've sometimes fallen into a trap of focusing just on making them longer, longer and taller. Um, and I think we need to kind of climb out of that a little bit. Um, and I think the Young Lives work in Peru, Ethiopia, others, has really demonstrated how there are a lot of things which can undermine our potential, which may not make us shorter. They are the psychosocial adversities, the displacement, the stress, the perinatal depression, the parental depression, um, in more extreme examples, conflict, displacement. These things will probably have an impact on our, our linear growth, but they'll have bigger impacts on our brain development. And we need to really understand what that means. Um, and there's other work that's being done around real cognitive neuroscience and imaging that's, that's looking at whether we, psychosocial adversity is probably, in many cases, a better predictor of IQ than stunting. So, so these, and this is very challenging, because we have projected and been very clear on the narrative to our ministers when I was at DFID, or our board and our founders, that, that this is the proxy and we can really focus on that. We need to be, we need to be a bit smarter about that. So that's the first trap. Um, the second trap has two pieces to it. The first, first one is this, the 1950s housewife trap, um, and the second part is the sector trap, and they're related. I'll come on to them. And it's about care. So I think th this session, the sort of framing notes for the session, talked about the importance of nutrition, health, and education for human capital, and they're, they're absolutely right, correct. Um, but let's just take a step above that. Um, what we are really trying to grapple with is the fact that no infant feeds herself no toddler knows when they're sick or which signs need medical intervention. No child has the insights into kind of 
developmental neuroscience to know the importance of early stimulation that's allowing their visual motor cortex to develop. So we need to really focus on the carer. And this, this intergenerational aspect of the Young Life study and that, inter, that, that potential to really understand that is, is absolutely critical. But we also need to not do, we need to not just focus on the parents. Um, well, I think one of the things that's quite clear is that as societies urbanize and as uh, women and men both uh, are more engaged in the labor force, there's a whole blind spot we have for where the children actually are. Um, you know, and I think one of the things we're trying to think about is how, what that means and what that looks like in terms of daycare that, that's, that's demanded, that's responded to, but that is probably not very good quality, or at least far from universally good quality. And it comes, you know, it's almost an analogy with the education, the explosion of, of access to terrible quality education. There's been an explosion of daycare in some urban areas, and not, not all, and there's, there's still a lot of people living in rural areas this doesn't apply to, but you know, we just need to not forget that explosion that's happened without any of us really taking a detailed understanding of that and thinking, what are the ways to understand this? What are the ways to intervene? And these are the type of points that I think are coming, coming to us. So I think there's two aspects to that. There's the 1950, we're not in the 1950s with housewives not working and maybe even 1930s. You know, women are engaged in the labor force increasingly and that's a wonderful thing and it creates some opportunities but it also means some different ways of thinking. Secondly, care and this aspect of whether that's daycare or parents and their interaction with their children is not a sector. It doesn't sit neatly in our, who's responsible for daycare? In the, in, in the UK, we talk about local authorities to being, being kind of responsible for sure start or increasingly no one. Um, but but there's, a, there's a real, there's a kind of gap there. Finally, and I've, well, that's fine, I'm not planning to get, hopefully get anywhere near the stop now to the sign. Um, finally, and this relates to this, young lives are increasingly urban. Um, we know urbanisation is not new. In fact, the Young Lives data showed some really interesting aspects of how urban urbanisation can change childhood, and, and sometimes very much for the better, and we've seen how migration studies can show those economic opportunities feeding through to the, the human capital. Um, but we also need to understand that there is some real risks of profound negative effects of child development. I mentioned childcare as one of them, but we're also really trying to understand things like air quality and the impact of that on intergenerational and, and uh, you know, both uh, du during pregnancy and in young, young lungs, if you could call it that. Um, and actually an, another way we're trying to think about that at SIF is to say, well, this is an issue we can all agree is a problem. Is this a proxy or a, a frame or a way of thinking that can actually have a co-benefit for how we're addressing this kind of global challenge of our time around climate change? At the same time, we're also thinking about water and sanitation. Uh, we're trying to understand what urbanization of food systems means, and there was a point in the, about double burdens, and I think we're only just starting to understand what the right tools are to respond to that reality that we're, let alone, in this country, let alone in the, uh, the Young Lives Studies. Um, so I guess the trap, the trap on the urban is, I think, as a, as a philanthropic foundation, and, and in fact all of us, um, we want to make sure we don't fall into a trap of focusing too much on yesterday's problems, and they may still be today's problems, but we need to really be looking on, on tomorrow's problems as well. So just to summarise, I think there's those three things. I, 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 just a, as a challenge for you all, I think we need to be all under thinking how we use the language of of stunting and proxies and what the ultimate objectives are and make sure we're not falling into a, a smarter, not just, we're making a, we're not falling into a just making people longer and taller, smarter, not just taller. Um, we're not thinking like it's the 1950s and there's housewives at home that we need to do home visiting for and expecting the child is that that's where they are. Um, we need to not get stuck in our sectors and we need to really think about yet yeah, tomorrow's problems as well as yesterday's. But finally, thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you so much for keeping to time. Let that be an example for all of us as the day goes on. So, we, we haven't got time for discussion now. We'll move straight off into Andy in a moment. What I'm going to suggest, because I know, because I know a little bit what's coming, topics are going to shift as time goes on. Have a think about what Rob just said. If you like, talk to your partner. I'm going to allow literally a minute to think, if you could ask a question now or make a comment, what would it be? But don't give it now, just have a think. Sounds like a Quaker meeting, most appropriate. <laughs> it's 
So while you're thinking, I shall start to introduce Andy, who's been with the project for nearly as long, I think, as I've been with the project as Emeritus Professor from South Africa, huge knowledge of human development issues, and most recently has been struggling with the question of how do you best represent longitudinal data, especially with such complex uh, multi-country, multi-cohort data on multiple indicators. And Anne is going to tell us a little bit about it. And along the way, because this is the beginning of the meeting, say, us a, little, say a little bit about how the Young Lives Research Design has allowed for these kinds of pieces of analysis. Andy. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. And particular thanks to Young Lives and the University of Oxford for inviting me to be part of this extraordinary initiative particularly to Joe as the director, and to pay particular thanks to Paul, with whom I've worked closely over the last few years. I'm going to be presenting data, as Martin said to you, um, on the a longitudinal analysis. I'm, I'm a developmental psychologist and a clinician as well, so I come at this animal from that sort of perspective, uh, and it's been a great privilege to work in a multidisciplinary group to achieve what we've done recently. My colleague uh, Colin Trudeau at the University of Cape Town has been a major driver of the analysis that I'll discuss with you in a, in a few minutes. That's the outline of the talk. Uh, the design quickly through that, just for a minute. And then Young Lives uses an ecological systems orientation, which is very close to my heart as a developmental person. And now I'm going to introduce the, develop the idea of a developmental cascade, which I'll explain in a minute, and then show just a wee bit of the modelling that we've done on the Young Lives longitudinal data for the younger cohort and introduce us to some critical issues around policy and intervention. And that will build quite a lot, in fact, on what Rob has just been talking to us about, going beyond taller to smarter and how to get there. Right, so there's the design. As you will see, you've got the two cohorts, the older cohort and the younger cohort. And what's significant, as was mentioned earlier on by Stefan, and Joe, was that you've got this time lag design. So you can see what's happening with an eight-year-old at a different point in history in the older cohort to the younger cohort. And you've got that finding that the younger cohort is doing better in terms of their growth outcomes, their educational outcomes, and so on, and indeed, better than their parents. So you've got a three-generational comparison, mum and dad, child, different points in history, different points in policy environment, really important because those things are shifting. So those are the rounds, those are the ages, end point 22 after 15 years, end point 15 years old after that period, and then along the bottom, a really important bunch of information, qualitative data on a couple of hundred children crossed over the, the uh, four countries in which we've followed children in conversation over that time, which provides critical, thicker understanding of what we see in the quantitative data and has real value in its own right. And I think that's something that's extremely important. And as Joe said, the five, round five data will be available soon in the UK data archive. So that's the design. And they're very, the other one that's important is at the bottom there, school surveys in each uh, country looking at children's progression through school, led by Kane here on the left, Kane Rolleston, and uh, which tell us about quality of schooling, opportunities to learn, uh, school outcomes over time, primary particularly. Okay, so that's the ecological framework. It's important to realize, obviously, that children grow up in context, and the critical outer, outer arrow, the social context, which includes the policy context, what's evolving over the course of children's development, which is the middle darker band. In the early childhood space, the middle childhood space, the adolescent space, and the young adult space, yeah? Institutional context, clinical, clinical services, health services, school services, and other institutions that bear upon children's lives. And then we have the arrows here indicating 
that children in the middle band there are exposed to different events that relate to their particular lived household and community and social context. So some children are more vulnerable to certain kinds of events, shocks we call them in young lives, droughts in rural areas, for example, even in some countries to political issue events of various kinds. Um, then those then impact on life events in the family context, the household context, death of a parent, loss of job, livelihood change, and so on. But those things are mediated and moderated by protective factors in the household, more resilient caretakers, for example, less resilient caretakers, and how does that then kick back into the child's development? So that is a kind of broad framing of the thinking behind the study at this time. Now, what I'm going to introduce you to here is the idea of a developmental cascade. This concept I find very helpful. It's derived from the work of Anne Maston and Absalom Kaspi, and people who worked on the Dunedin Longitudinal Study in, in New Zealand, which some of you may be familiar with. Now, what we see on the left hand bar, we've really got the phases of childhood here. What we know and what we're seeing in young lives and many other studies, this is at one cascade, and the cascade bears upon skills, okay? So you could invent a cascade for psychosocial development, you could invent it for learning outcomes such as this, you could invent it for a range of other attributes that you want to see emerging at that, oops, sorry, oops, um, at that end point in life. So the front end of life, not to fall, beyond stunting and health, to cognitive development, brain development, and so on, leading to low readiness for school. Middle childhood, weak basic skills as a consequence of challenges in schooling that are compounded from early on, poor progress, risk of dropout, poor job prospects, and then we have the kickback to an intergenerational transmission of disadvantage and poverty over time. And these things at the household context, which we looked at a minute ago, poverty, food insecurity, family stress, and shocks. And as Rob mentioned, family stress is something I don't think we've paid enough attention to in this work, and I will point to that in a minute. So the policy context then, inadequate social protection, weak basic services, by that I mean electricity, wash, water, sanitation, hygiene, those sort of things. We focus a lot on growth stunting and food, but a lot of it's about childhood disease in the period from well, maternal disease, from conception, right through to five years. So in young lives, for example, we often see a, ra a rise in growth stunting from a year old to five years old. That's not about always about a lack of food. It's about poor sanitation and poor hygiene in the household environment. And that's a policy issue and a service issue. Poor schooling and poor public health services, right? So we've got to put that package together. It's not about a one thing, it's complicated. All right, so I'm going to show you one small piece of some modeling Colin Trudeau and I did over the past couple of years. It's been a huge mission. And I'd like to thank the Young Lives team, everybody, for helping us pull that data together. It's been quite an exercise. We presented a forerunner of this at the uh, Young Lives Advisory Group last year, this very time, I think. They gave us some very good advice, and we hopefully fixed it. That's what it looks like. Now, um, there's a pointing thing on here, is there? Yeah. All right, so this is the first five years of life, the grey bit, yeah? So what we did was we modelled the impact of household wealth on growth stunting, and you'll see a negative relation. That's a blob, blob, but it's supposed to be a minus. It shows basically the obvious thing, that household wealth is negatively related to growth stunting. Big, no big surprise. Maternal education, mums who have better education are more likely to be in wealthier families, no surprise. But what that also predicts is attendance at preschool. So an important driver of children going to preschool is having mums, in this instance, to appreciate the importance of early learning and things of that sort. We then see a really important phenomenon here is that there's a positive relationship between maternal mental health, 
and household wealth, yeah? Turn it around and the risk for men mental health problems in mums goes up as mental uh, household wealth goes down. And particularly important um, is the, there's not supposed to be two arrows over here, something went wrong with my construction, but a negative relationship between me me mental health and growth stunting. There's a lot of literature that shows what we call a dense covariance between matern maternal mental health and a range of early childhood outcomes from um, Ted Wax's work and others, Atif Rahman in Pakistan. And that relates to uh, people who are just so burdened by the overload of poverty and everything that goes with it that the attention, the care on the child is compromised, not because they don't care, but because the emotional energy to care is drained by the burden of many children, deep poverty, often domestic violence, booze, and so on. And that kicks on to growth stunting. So that's the early childhood thing, better preschool, and of course, early quantitative skills are enhanced by attending a better preschool. We, 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 it's not just going to preschool. We scaled that using a proxy for, for quality, and you see that outcome there. And then kicking on, what we, if the final outcome here is mass growth. But first, we measured this in the 8 to 15 year period, and we measured that, right? How much time they spend on these things. You'll see here, we're interested in how much their mathematics ability grew over three points in time. And this is a bit of a, an, an unkosher way of representing it, but hopefully it makes it simple for people. It's a growth model, right? A latent growth model for those who know that stuff. And what we saw is that in middle childhood, it's not enough to stop here. Not enough to stop here. Kids who spend more time having to work on chores because they are, uh, as they're getting older, they're in poorer families, negative relationship with the amount of mathematics ability outcome, the skill at the end of the time. And those who are spending more time on school and studies at home are doing better in that. So this slope does that. For those kids, it flattens out for the less advantaged children, okay? So that's a modeling that summarizes what we've got from all four of the countries. This is not one country. That's why we don't have coefficients in it. So Peru, India, Vietnam, Ethiopia, what are the common findings coming together? And the thick black lines are the big effects, and the thinner lines are the small, less powerful effects, but they're all there. There's more than this, I've just pulled out the big picture. And what's good about this is that it shows that Young Lives has massive external validity for policy purposes. If you're seeing something similar happening everywhere, despite those contrasts, then this is you get. So this is my last slide. What are the implications here? What matters? Being healthy and ready for school. What makes a difference? Maternal and child nutrition from the beginning. Attentive care maternal mental health, maternal education, family support, and quality preschool. That then provides a strong foundation which promotes healthy growth and development, starting school on time, age-appropriate grade progression, achieving expected outcomes, and there's the particular, the, the third one in adolescence, healthy growth and development, school completion equipped for further education, and the inputs that you want to see for this, particularly a lot of people don't pay attention to safety in school. Young lives finds that when the school's unsafe, people leave. It just, it's a toxic place to be, so it's a child protection issue. When they, girls go to the toilet, it's dangerous, and so on and so forth. And then the final thing, of course, is that you need this env enabling environment across childhood, that you need to make choices in each country as to what the fiscal situation permits. Yeah? So where do you put your, your, your money? At the front end, and I think what this data is showing from this study, particularly improving the educational space as you move into primary and later school. Oops, that's it. I don't know why it's not good. Thank you so much, Andy for distilling 15 years of work with 12,000 children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that brief pause for you to think about if you could ask questions to Andy, what would they be? And we'll just hold them. 
and we're going to turn now to Renault. And there's a good link here to Renault because what Andy was just talking about was the attempt to distill all the work that we've done through the longitudinal data collection over all this long period into a model that represents our best understanding of the processes, that inf what's happening in infancy, linking to what happened in middle childhood, and blah, 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 blah. And as he said, it's a condensation for all four countries. But as, as you're well aware, one of the exciting features and important features of Young Lives is how we've realized how different the countries are for children. I mean, it's kind of obvious these are four very different countries. But we've been able to show that empirically in the work we've done. We can't cover that all now, but we have got Renu with, her, with us, who's been country director for, for India over many years. And Erin is going to give us a little bit of insight into some of the distinctive features of what childhood has meant for young lives children in India. Thank you, Renu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. And I'm going to attempt um, to give you uh, an insight into some of the intersecting inequalities um, that we have evidence from India. Um, and of course, I think we've already heard um, uh, you know, from Andy as well as Rob in terms of what really it seems to matter to, as children grow up. And I think drawing from the sample that we have in India, um, which is in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, incidentally, the political context changed over the period of 15 years. Uh, the undivided Andhra Pradesh became Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. So that's, that's another piece that we had to grapple with in 2014, just before the fifth round. Um, and as Andy has already told you, we are in seven districts, now 11 uh, by default, um, mix of urban and rural sites, and we use mixed methods. Um, so for, for those of you who are familiar with Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, we are in the coastal region, uh, as well as Rail Sima and Telangana. Um, and we have a technical note on our website which could give you, tell you more about our sample of 3,000 children. Um, in terms of what do we see over the years, Based on wealth index, um, you know, which is really uh, looking at housing quality, consumer durable index, and access to services such as sanitation, water, and electricity, we find that. You know, okay, let me just get this going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see that there there has been definitely uh, an increase in wealth index over time. This is the light bars are the 2002 wealth index and the dark bars are 2016. So over time, this is for all households. You can see that the, the STs uh, remain, they have made the maximum gains, but yet, if you look at where they are, they're still right at the bottom, and the divide between other castes were the most privileged socially and remain also economically privileged, compared to the STs followed by the SCs, the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes remain disadvantaged households across the five rounds of our data. Of course, there is definitely an urban advantage to the households. There's the wealth index for the urban households in 2016, which hasn't really gone up too much because of, look at where the starting point was in 2002. Rural households are still behind, lag behind uh, households. But I think what is important to see is we've seen which houses were persistently poor, who remain at the bottom tercile across all five rounds, and those are a third of the ST households, and that's really something to be worried about. So almost 30, you know, 31% of our scheduled tribe households remained persistently poor across all five rounds, and obviously children would be disadvantaged who come from these households. Uh, in terms of um, water you know, and sanitation, which you know, has been already referred to, we find that 38% of our ST households still did not have access to uh, sanitation facilities. And those, are, those obviously have cumulative effects on children's uh, well-being. 
I'm moving, going to move to school enrollment, and these are all four countries, and you can see the, you know, where girls are more likely to be enrolled and where boys are more likely to be enrolled. The gender, the pro-boy bias remained across all four rounds, and these are four rounds at age eight, 12, 15, and 19. And you can see that the gap, gender gap, in favor of boys, you know, increases across time, as compared to even Ethiopia, where there is a pro-girl bias, which is, you know, which is very surprising, because India consistently has this entrenched gender pro-boy bias uh, across time. And this increases over time, and th therefore, I think this is something that we really need to worry about, because I think even as enrollments are increasing, um, and if you look at, this is just the India data, um, you, the red uh, line is uh, the, the, ch the children who were persistent from the households which I said were persistently poor over time. And you can see at 19, just about a third of children were enrolled at 19 uh, compared to from the persistently poor household compared to 75% from the least poor, which means they remained at the top tercile across all five rounds. Uh, this is four rounds, really. So, I mean, I think what I'm trying to say is that not only do you have a gender bias, but obviously girls from the persistently poor households are least likely to continue education because there is this cumulative disadvantage and girls from ST households, which remained in the persistently poor households and where girls were born, were more least likely to continue in education. This is uh, data on you know, private schools and very interestingly, we find that uh, while 23% of the households uh, had sent their children to private schools, and this is in 2002 with the eight-year-olds, this increased to 44% in 2009. Round three, we can do the cross-cohort comparisons. So this doubled. Private low-fee charging schools is where our children went to because you know our children are not from the wealthiest families. And you can see that across, the, there is still a prejudice in terms of boys, more boys going uh, in 2009, going to private schools, almost half the boys were being sent to private schools in comparison to 37% of the girls. Most of the urban children were going to private low-fee charging schools com compared to the third. So even in rural areas, and there's a lot of qualitative data, which I'm afraid I don't have the time to present, which really shows how parents you know, believe and perceive that private schools are much better and therefore they will spend the money uh, on frees as well as uniforms and transportation rather than send them to public schools which are free of charge. Even amongst the, you know, you can see that there are aspirations and even amongst the scheduled tribes which are, you know, which just 21% sent their children to private schools, one out of 10 did want to send their children to what they believe were better schools. So there are huge aspirations we find within our households. Um, but unfortunately, when you look at learning levels, this is the, the comparable three questions that we asked uh, of the 15-year-olds in 2009, the older cohort, and 2016, younger cohort. So the blue bars are the 2009 answers answered correctly for the same questions. You can see the three questions at the bottom of the, the graph. Um, and the average scores, very sadly, uh, while 11.8% of the 15-year-olds answered all three questions correctly, this decreased to 10%. Uh, and you can see that there is a decrease across both government and private schools. So it's, it's not as though just the public schools children are doing badly. The decline is also in the private schools, though it is probably, well, it's from 20% it came down to 14%, whereas there is a marginal decline in the government schools, which were anyway very poorly placed. So I think there is a real learning crisis um, in India, and we really need to address it for the poorest children, and we cannot ignore that. So who is really in school at 19? You can see that there, you know, the, the, the purple uh, bars are for those who are not enrolled, and there are 58% girls not enrolled at 19 compared to 44% boys. Um, rural children, 64% almost not in school. And again, the worst off are the scheduled tribe children, 59%, uh, and the SC children, scheduled caste children. And also the BC children at 19, a very large proportion of them no longer in school. 
uh, with the older, with the other castes, socially advantaged, continuing to be very much uh, pr continuing education. Uh, and we asked children during the survey, what are the key reasons why you, you know, discontinued education? These are really uh, the children citing uh, what reasons they felt were, you know, this is based on their, their own uh, responses. And marriage, interestingly, right before upper primary, which is grade eight, for those children who discontinued education before upper primary, those who discontinued education before grade 10, as well as those who discontinued education uh, before class 12, marriage was the key reason why girls dropped out of school. And this is often completely ignored uh, as a key reason. So these are really pull out reasons, not push out sc only school related reasons. Of course, domestic chores and long absence from school was the other two reasons which were cited by children. For boys, they were very different. You know, the, the long absence from school, which is also related to a lot of household pressures, you know, taking part in the harvesting season. They're often, there are long periods that children have not attended school and our qual has picked up how children go back to school after three months and then they don't understand what has they have missed and then they often they are insulted by teachers or they are reproached by teachers and they decide to drop out. So there, it's a cumulative effect. So I think these are all interrelated to a long, large extent, but paid work was the, the second reason most cited you know, at before those who dropped out before upper primary as well as secondary. And paid work again came up as a key reason for those who drop out before 12. So as they grow older, reasons are changing uh, slightly. Um, and of course the time use data and you know, no surprise, we've, this is, you know, we've collected time use data in each of the rounds. And if you look at uh, 12 years, 15 years and 19 years, uh, caring work for the girls uh, continues to grow. Yeah, and it is much more than the boys. Um, domestic chores for the girls, much more than the boys. Uh, and of course, boys do more paid work. So this is the paid work this, which is increasing for the boys, particularly at 19. Uh, but if you look at the total paid and unpaid work, the burden is much more on girls than boys. Yeah, across ages. And I think this, this socialization into girls doing certain kinds of work and boys taking up another, including paid work, is also seen at age 22, where many more boys now are in work, getting into work than the girls are in round five. Um, and you know, this, so I mean, just to put it together, I mean, you can see poverty, location, risk, and responsibility um, is really shaping later trajectories. and. Uh, some of the work that has been done by my colleagues, uh, you know, in terms of predictors of secondary school completion in India, uh, children who didn't do any paid work at age 12, who did less than two hours of domestic chores at age 12, had better reading scores at age eight, as well as had higher self-efficacy at age 12, are much more likely to complete secondary education. And since marriage, you know, has emerged as one of the critical uh, factors for girls leaving school particularly, those who were not enrolled at 15 years had lower child, you know, uh, parents who had uh, lower ex aspirations for their children, uh, as well as low, those who belong to lower wealth uh, households, lower, uh, more likely to get married early. And I think these as well as have teenage pregnancy, and I think these are areas that have huge policy you know, implications for us. And of course, this is not to um, ignore the fact that you know, any shocks at the household level uh, have long-term consequences on children. So just uh, to end, I would just say that it's important for us to pay attention to accumulation and maintenance of human capital over the life course. And I think the longitudinal study has given us this great advantage of being able to look at the early determinants affecting later outcomes. Of course, at, 20, you know, at 22, the children aren't really well settled into the labor market, as Stefan said. We will need to do more rounds to be able to understand that, but I think it's also important to understand the multidimensional nature of childhood poverty. It has come out from a lot of our papers, and that adolescence remains really largely an unrecognized, but a very important second critical window of opportunity. And we need to address gender, discrimination and the norms and expectations for girls particularly in our in our country thank you very much
thank you, Renaud. So Renaud's given just one snapshot around one country of the four in terms of some of the issues that really affect India. And if we did the same story for each of the countries, we'd see, yes, some themes in common, but some completely different, which is one of this, again, enriching quality of the Young Life study in that it doesn't pretend a very simplistic sense of what development means in, 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 over childhood. It's so dependent on the continents in which children. I want to add one other thing. Renault was desperate when I talked with her yesterday to include examples of our qualitative research. Wonderful case studies of individual children that we have and are documented and they're in the publications. There just wasn't space, so I apologise to Renu yesterday. But it's in your interest because you'll get coffee instead of qualitative research. Maybe. Anyway, we won't make that decision. Um, we have about five, ten minutes. We've had three very different presentations. I'm going to invite you to make comments or brief questions. And what we'll do is we'll take all of them at one hit to begin with at least, see how we get on. And then I'll invite whoever wants to, to, so who wants to go first? Please, please announce who you are. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Richard Dowdy, I'm from Africa, but most of my life was a journalist. I've been in North Africa for some time. Um, uh, yeah, there are many studies of eldest girl children, because what I've noticed is that they always become mini mothers. But also, I often ask women who are successful African women um, you know, to talk about family, and often they are the eldest girl. So, has anybody done any study of this? Okay, let's just hold that one. Thank you very much. And then, more comments, questions, please. Hi, I'm Sergius from Oxford Policy Management, and also a student. Uh, quick uh, question for Andy. I was wondering if you could comment on the linearity of your model. Because, for example, it seems like the relationships are expected to be quite linear. Uh, but I wonder if there's variation across that. As one example, just uh, you know, often children work more so that they can afford to go to school, so that they can actually, you know, and, and maybe in relation, what the qualitative findings are in relation to that model, and if, if there was any sort of problems. Thank you. We'll hold that one, and then yes. Hello, I'm Rachel Hinton from Divid. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic um, presentation. So two, two questions, short questions. The first is, um, what lessons can you share around how you've actually managed to get the qualitative and quantitative um, discussions <coughs> working together? Because we know how siloed the disciplines are. And I think it's absolutely um, phenomenal that we've done this across all of the country work. Um, and the second is to Renault. I think the other thing that's very different about young lives, and, and we heard from both Stefan and Martin earlier, is you've got very close connections with policy um, makers at a country level. And um, I'd like to hear from Renu about what the implications from the data you've shown us around gender um, are there for the policy makers. Yes, sir. Hi, Richard Morgan. So the children. This may come up later, but I wanted to ask Andy if, if you wanted to comment on the role of social protection in relation to child outcomes, social protection, aka cash, and whether a loan, uh, as a sort of single intervention, it can be expected to make a difference, and or whether it needs to be combined with other interventions, given the multiple causality of child outcomes that we so strongly highlight. Thank you. And I'm going to suggest just one more, or we'll have too many questions to begin to address them, sir. Good night, I'm from the IAB. Uh, 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 one question to Rob, and one then to uh, the to the panel. Uh, Rob, your focus on looking at this issue about smarter and the care. It's the care model, the care element in the child development was always there, or it was actually brought in implicitly in the 1990s. But you're suggesting that we haven't really got that taken that further. But are, you, are we at risk of losing what we're learning about also the stunting side of nutrition? Like if you go, are you going to push us into a new area while neglecting what we know is really important in the other? And the question for the panel is, 
are you seeing anything in the new data that is changing radically in terms of what will be for the, for the period we're coming into for the SDGs? How do we pick out anything that's different? Is it migration? Are we seeing different sort of family structures because of that? What's, what do we think is the new, if, if, or is it just the same? Thank you so much. So in the few minutes we have, I'll first of all invite the panelists to comment on the questions they'd like to comment, to comment on. And then if there are, I think there may be some of these that there are people in the room best able to answer them. And of course, there's the rest of the day. Let's see how we get on. Who would like to respond to any of those comments, questions? Would you like to go first, Rob? Um, yeah, let me just take that, that final question, because I think that's a really important point. Um, and as I said, it's trying to be a little bit provocative, but certainly not. I, I, you know, so the first thing is I would say absolutely no. We don't, we don't want to be moving off from... And, and we need to be very careful how we reframe, I think. I think there is a need for reframing, but I think we need to be careful how we do it because it is an incredibly powerful narrative. I've used it a lot myself in Diffid and Tiff around the importance of human capital and stunting as a proxy, and we... It's very powerful precisely because it's explainable. We all understand a, a height measure or a tape measure. Um, so it's a way to talk to someone that they can get their head around. But having said that, I think there's a big acknowledgement within the nutrition world that actually, once we stop looking at describing and start looking at intervening, there's a real challenge with tying ourselves to stunting reduction uh, as the outcome, especially if we're looking at something to allow us to iterate and learn and course correct as we go, which is the nature of big, large investment programs, both within uh, donors like DFID, but also national governments. They, they want measures that they can use to help learn. Um, and stunting is quite a difficult one for that because of some of the time lags and confounding involved. And, and there's been quite a lot written recently around stunting not being the best measure for us to be tying ourselves to in nutrition. So, so no, we need to absolutely learn what's worked. But I suppose one of the things that we've... My sense is that... And again, I don't want to frame it wrong, but the... the the modelled studies of looking at uh, multiple benefits of overlapping interventions scaled up to 90% in the Lancet um, are very hard to translate to the reality of a large-scale programme. Um, and when we promise to do that through our programmes, we often under-deliver um, and then undermine the long-term case for support. So I think we need to... Actually, one of the things we're learning from large-scale uh, focus on stunting is that we're seeing it's a broad set of things that influence that. It's around changing gender norms, it's around the social development more broadly, it's around the, uh, and, and coming to the point around cash transfers, it's around some of these things that, that speak across and outside of sectors. Um, and on care, I th absolutely, I care is there in the, the sort of theories, it's there in the nutrition kind of conceptual framework, it's there in the early child development kind of narrative. I, I think the point I want to make is that we need to think who's doing the care and who's providing the care. And in fact, that comes to some of the data from India, which really, and this point around first uh, elder siblings, um, sometimes that's the eldest, often girl child. Uh, other times it's the neighbor, or it's the, the person around the corner who's set this up as a income generating activity around the childcare. And, and we, we do almost nothing to really understand those dynamics, um, particularly the, 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 the for-profit, low-cost daycare piece. Um, so I think care's there, but it's who's, doing, who's providing the care is the sort of challenge that we're trying to make sure we're not missing, I guess. Um, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rob. Who wants to go next? Okay. So um, regarding mixed methods, I think we've been really fortunate because we've had this multidisciplinary team uh, and right from um, tool development for the survey rounds in which the qual researchers play a key role, I must tell you. Uh, it's not as though qual is seen as a complement to the survey, but I think we really do work as a team together to the mixed methods papers that we've written and the country reports, by the way, that have just been written, uh, drawing all five rounds also use mixed methods. So I think we've we really have tried to uh, bring together expertise from different disciplines together to be able to complement each other rather than, you know, uh, one taking the lead. Um, 
And um, in terms of policy implications on gender, uh, Rachel, uh, to answer your question, I think one of the key things that um, emerged from the data was that 37% of the 19-year-olds in India were already married. Uh, and that came as a rude shock to policymakers because uh, other data sets, national data sets, show a much lower uh, incidence rate. And longitudinal data doesn't lie. And I think that's, you go to a cross, do a cross-sectional study and ask, when did you get married? And they'll all say, well, after 18. And how do you then capture that, you know, to say that this is valid or accurate data? Uh, so I think this came as a real shock. And then we did take this to the policymakers uh, who asked us to look at the census and analysis. And thanks to SIF, we were able to do that piece of data analysis. And I think we've, we've been able to um, bring child marriage back on the policy table. I think it's being t looked at very seriously. Uh, the Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao Andolan that is being t undertaken is now taken up long, very large campaigns to address not just child marriage, but also the underlying factors such as dowry. You know, if you don't address dowry, for example, child marriage will continue. So looking at all those and, and keeping girls in schools, and now we've just had the CAPE Committee, which is the Central Advisory Board on Education, agree that uh, the right to education needs to be moved up to secondary level. So we're going to, it's from 14, it's being taken up to the age of 16. Uh, so you'll have free and compulsory education right up to 16, as well as starting from, you know, primary classes being added to every primary school as well as from, you know, so you're bringing down the age from six to four, probably. Uh, so I think that's, that's all. And it's not just due to us, of course. There are many players uh, which, who have been lobbying with us, and I think uh, the networks that we have really help. Thank you, Renu. Andy, I'm going to be, I'm so unkind to you very frequently. I'm going to say just literally a minute. Thank you. Right. One minute starting now, without repeating or deviating. Um, the, uh, what I'm going to do, is, uh, Suresh, I'm going to ask you to refer to the Young Lives paper on this thing, which will be out, I think, by the end of the month or early next month. I'll give you the reference. Um, maybe in terms of Richard Gordon, you, you asked a question around social protection. Social protection can achieve quite a lot, but not everything. And I think particularly in, in the early period, we, we put that into the models, we tried it, we tested it, but there was very little variation in each country most people were getting some form of social protection. There were variable forms in India, so you couldn't really join things up and say, well, which bit? So it, it dropped out of the models. But in the South African case, for example, we have our universal cash transfer, the child support grant, and it's very clear from the National Income Dynamics study that that reduces growth stunting and seems to improve cognitive outcomes in the first five, six years of life. So, and also more children go to school and so on and so forth. So, good idea for that. We don't know whether that would help to reduce the stress on mothers and i.e. improve mental health outcomes for vulnerable women. It's a question which we need to test, but I suspect that it would be so. It's not going to shift a lot of other things. So, I think what one needs to do is to look at the issue on the basis of evidence at each point in the life cycle across through late adolescence and say, what needs to be changed and what's the best form of intervention that will leverage that change? Social protection can't do everything. Thanks so much, Andy. And thank you so much, Renu, Andy, and Rob. Really interesting presentations on a wide range of topics related to, to what Young Lives has been doing. We're moving to coffee. I know those questions weren't all answered, but there is time over coffee, and there's the whole of the rest of the day. So let, let's keep them in mind, and, 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 and the earliest, earliest child one I was particularly interested. I'm sure we've got stuff in our data. Handing over to Sam. Again, many thanks to Renu, Andy, and Rob um, for providing such a rich amount of material in a short time, and to Martin for grace under pressure. 
That was amazing. Thank you for that great sharing. We're going to go into a coffee break. We've got just about 20 minutes, but one quick announcement before you go. You might see that there is someone taking photos amongst us. Um, there might be a few snaps here and there that show up on the Young Lives website or in some publications. Um, hopefully you'll be happy to be looking smiley and beautiful in those. Um, but if for some reason you prefer not to be um, part of the photographic record, that's absolutely fine. Please um, come up to myself or anyone in the Young Lives team to say that you'd rather not be part of the photos, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so we will see you at um, about 11.18 for an 11.20 kickoff. Welcome to coffee just outside.